We'll wait a few more seconds for all of our um, viewers to see us. Um, I am speaking to you, it's eight o'clock here in the East Coast, five o'clock in the West and two o'clock in Hawaii. And uh, I'm speaking to you from the basement of the estate of Chris O'Brien, uh, that's me, uh, in the man cave. Uh, just in case you were wondering, any of you viewers, I'm in a rocking chair that has hockey sticks on it. So it's not as somebody is sneaking up behind me. Although that could happen. Uh, people are pretty much sick of Zoom. So if they can get a call to stop while you're in the room with them, they probably will. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, you're part of our virtual open house. Um, open houses and opportunities to learn about a college are much more fun in person. But certainly events have conspired to keep us away from each other. And we hope that those uh, events and these circumstances resolve themselves sooner rather than later. Because um, we'd love to welcome you to campus and see our hospitality firsthand. But just because we can't be together uh, doesn't mean that we cannot talk college. Uh, for those of you who are seniors, you've been working so hard, you certainly deserve to be at a place that is going to allow you to flourish and be the best self you can be. And if you're juniors, this is a great opportunity to start to learn about what happens in college and how the process should start. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on freshman year. And what better way to talk about freshman year than to talk to sophomores? Uh, so what we're going to do tonight is uh, I've uh, introduced, I will introduce you and actually they'll introduce themselves, but I am uh, presenting with some students that I've known and, and watched navigate through their first year and now they're coming to their second year of college and what we're going to talk about tonight is how that happens for students and how that happens at Boston College. Um, much has been made and should be made of the transition from high school to college. And uh, it's important to understand when you're enrolling at an institution, what kind of care they're going to take of you when you get there uh, and the support on all levels, whether it's academic and intellectual, whether it's social and spiritual, we wanna make sure that our students feel as though, um, despite the fact they're in a new place uh, and on the path to a profession or a path to graduate school, um, and, and not with their friends from home or they're or far away from their parents, that they still feel that there are people that have their back and people that want the best for them and people that support them even when their time when times are a little bit tougher for them. Uh, so I'm gonna have a, uh, our panelists introduce themselves and um, we'll go around in alphabetical order by first name. Uh, incidentally, please uh, do see that in the boxes that they have listed their email addresses already, which should give you the sense that their willingness to continue the conversation about freshman year or the things that we talk about, they're very willing to do that. So if you guys can introduce yourself, uh, who you are and where you're from and what you study would be helpful. And then um, why don't we do this? Why don't you talk about, like describe like the, the big picture of freshman year with an adjective and give us a little bit of an explanation of why that adjective seems to fit what you dealt with and what you saw in your freshman year. Uh, and then we'll probably revisit that as well as other things uh, as we move along and introduce everybody. So why don't we get to know who we're uh, gonna be hearing from tonight. Uh, a quick look at the names say that, you know, again, my, my alphabet's a little bit rusty, but B probably comes first. So Brian, uh, set the bar high, get us started. Let us know who you are and give us a little bit of sense how freshman year was for you. Will do. Thank you, Chris. So hello, everyone. My name is Brian Gardner. And as everyone is on this panel, I'm a sophomore. I'm from Foxborough, Massachusetts. And I am currently studying finance and business analytics in our Carroll School of Management. And I also have a major in psychology in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. And my adjective I would give would probably be busy. I think um, we will hear a whole lot more about it, obviously, as this panel goes on. But I would say that in my mind, it was always kind of scattered with finding new friends to replace those from high school. Um, in my case, trying to find which extracurriculars I wanted to do and where I really enjoyed my time the most. How to navigate through the academics is obviously a big deal, as well as you know the location you're in, living in a new situation with a new roommate. There's so much going on, so much to think about that I think it's a very busy time in any way you look at it. Great stuff. Jen, uh, you're next. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Hi, everyone, my name is Jen. I am also a sophomore. I am from Orlando, Florida. I'm currently studying Applied Psychology and Human Development in the Lynch School of Education and Human Development with a double major in Political Science in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I'd say my experience freshman year to describe it with an adjective would be humbling overall, and not to say that coming in, I was just 
thinking I was going to be top of the class right away or anything. Um, but I think the challenges that freshmen are faced with academically, socially, and kind of all together really do kind of make you think of yourself kind of in a bigger setting, in a larger setting. And I thought that was super helpful to know that it's okay that I can't handle 50 extracurriculars and all my academics all at once. Um, and that there are people that are just more attuned to other skills that maybe I thought I was better at in high school, but found a different route for myself. And so I think that was super helpful in my freshman year. Okay, good job. Uh, next is you, Maddie. Hi everyone. Um, thanks so much, Jen and Brian for your intros. My name is Maddie McGrath. I am also a sophomore. I'm from Glenview, Illinois, and I'm studying political science and economics in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. Um, my one word to describe freshman year would probably be evolving. Um, Jen said something a little bit similar, but I think that um, not only does BC bring a freshman experience of a lot of new opportunity, but it also encourages a lot of reflection and a lot of realization on who you are and what you're meant to be. Um, obviously, it's an ongoing journey throughout your four years of college, but I would say that my freshman year was full of many new opportunities and many new relationships, activities, academic endeavors that really compelled me to consider you know, who I am, what am I passionate about, um, what brings me joy. I love it. Great job, Maddie. Uh, and Michaela, last but certainly not least. Thank you, Chris. Thank you guys so much. Your introductions are great. My name is Michaela Sanchez. I am a sophomore like everyone else here. I'm originally from Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, which is like central Jersey, if you think it's if you think it exists. Um, I am double majoring in history and sociology and minoring in management and leadership. And history and sociology is in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences and management and leadership is in the Carroll School of Management. And I think my one word to describe freshman year or two words would kind of be um, eye-opening because I feel like a lot of people that come into BC, apply to BC, are extremely driven. They come in with a four-year plan. They're like, I'm coming here. I'm going to learn what I need to learn. And I'm going to graduate with this degree and these extracurricular activities. And I feel like I was very driven like that in high school. And it was kind of like a reality check to get here and see that the classes that I thought I was going to be so excited to take weren't really what I was looking for in my college experience and in the future. So we're going to talk a little bit about the core curriculum, I'm sure, later. But that really helped me see what other um, other curriculums, other courses that I could take that could gear me into a place that I wanted to be in rather than sticking to a set plan that I thought I could come in with freshman year. So definitely eye-opening in the experiences that I would have academically and socially here at BC. You know, four introductions, so many majors and so many minors. Make sure I get back to talk a little bit about how in such a short amount of time you figured out all these multiples of majors and minors. Uh, and maybe that's a question on people's minds. So let's, let's go way back to when you were coming to BC. So your high school self, you were just prom queen, you had just done all these things in your senior year at spring. Like what was your biggest concern? You're coming to BC, you know you're coming to BC. Maybe two of you can sort of tell me what was your biggest concern coming to Boston College? I can start off with this one. I think um, being from Florida and just thinking about coming to Boston, my biggest concern was making friends or coming, finding someone that had similar interests to me because of how far away I was going. Um, I didn't know anyone going into BC, so that was definitely something that um, was kind of freaking me out and not being sure if I would find my place, find my home. And I think that's very valid, uh, even for people that are uh, within Massachusetts, maybe just not as close to BC. It's still a change and an adjustment from your group of friends that you've been growing up with for so long. Um, but like with that, I will say that that fear is normal. However, it does force you to kind of step outside of your comfort zone and meet new people and kind of get involved in different things. Good point. How about someone else? What was, their, what was your biggest concern coming to college, coming to BC? I would say for me, I kind of alluded to it in my intro, but it would be deciding what I want to do with my time. I was always super involved in high school and I knew I wanted to continue that. But a lot of my high school involvements were things like sports or being in the band. And I didn't know if I wanted to go into club sports or bring my trumpet or euphonium with me to school. So I think a lot of my kind of nerves were about what would I do to spend my time and how easy would it be for me to find clubs that I was passionate about. I think thankfully BC did a great job of kind of exposing me to what existed out there and and teaching me like where I can spend my time and what I really enjoy and I'm grateful for that. But certainly entering college, that was something that was an unknown for me and therefore quite nerve wracking or worrying as I came to a new place. 
So the first interaction you had with Boston College as a legit Boston College class of 23, four, three, three, student, three, uh, was orientation. So uh, your group came to campus. The group last summer wasn't able to. We're hopeful that this group, the 25s, will be able to come to campus. So let's talk about the traditional orientation. If one of you can sort of talk about what was helpful uh, um, going through an orientation process and what did you learn? What made you comfortable? What, what, was, what was your takeaway from Boston College orientation? Yeah, thank you, Chris. I love this question. Um, comparing the BC experience and the BC orientation to other schools, I think, is dramatically different. So a lot of my friends were like dreading going to orientation. It was a one-day process. They would just get their schedules and go back home, and they were excited to return to campus in the fall. But here at BC, we have a three-day orientation, and it's over the course of three days. We stay here for two nights in the beautiful senior dorms, kind of tempting us a little bit to live there. Um, but it's a lot of not just figuring out classes and talking to upperclassmen, but also a lot of reflection. We were doing deep talks about diversity and things like that in small groups with our orientation leaders, who I'm still in contact with today. I literally text them all the time if I ever need help. I see them on campus and I give them a hug. And we just created those great, connections with upperclassmen and amongst each other. We talked about things, there was one topic that we talked about, um, it was about what's something someone can tell about you by looking at you and why is that important? And what's something that someone can't tell about you by looking at you and why is that important? So you can really make these conversations as deep as you want, but I know my group got super, super close. I still text a bunch of them today because we did have the opportunity to get no to get to know people on a deeper level while also meeting with advisors that helped us pick our classes. Classes that I didn't think I was gonna take, but they knew the different professors that were excellent, different classes I might not have leaned towards. And they really helped me figure out how I could go into my freshman year being well prepared in the classes that I was taking. Perfect. And that's what we're trying to do at orientation. I mean, I think you did everything that orientation had to offer, which, which is awesome. Uh, make those connections with older students, feel confident about your academic transition. Like that's, that's the answer to the questions in the brochure about orientation. So well done. Um, then the next thing that happens is you get your room assignment and you find out you have a roommate. So can we, can we go through the roommate selection process? Um, I bet with four people, a couple of you may have done it differently. So maybe uh, let's, let's hear from a couple of you about how you chose or how a roommate was chosen for you. Yeah, I can speak on that one. Um, there are many different ways that you can go about choosing a roommate at BC. Um, one way that's pretty common is through a Facebook group. So um, upon being accepted to BC, you will get an email saying you are invited to join the official Boston College class of 2025 or 2027, depending on how old you are watching this, which makes me feel very old. Um, but you're invited to join a Facebook group where um, all incoming students have a platform to introduce themselves to one another, to share common interests, to just sort of put themselves out there and give a first impression, meet new people um, before even stepping foot on the campus, which looking back is kind of a funny thing because I see so many people on the Facebook group that I know now, but think, oh my gosh, like way back when. Um, so I found a girl on the Facebook group. We started messaging, um, got along very well. We found out that we share a lot of the same living habits, which is a very important thing in choosing a, choosing a roommate. Um, and then we submitted our housing application through BC and requested a double, um, which we then received. Um, most freshmen live in traditional doubles. There's also quads, natural triples, and lofted triples, if anyone else wants to speak to that. Well, I just want to mostly, mostly talk about sort of how you found somebody because maybe none of you had a roommate in your life. And maybe this was something you were particularly nervous about. You never had to share a room or certainly you've never had to spend that much time with some, you're, you have never slept that close to somebody that you never really met before. So there's, a, there's an element of, uh, maybe I wanna to get to know this person a little bit more. Um, so you heard one connection. Uh, how about one of, uh, one of the other three of you to talk a little bit about if there was any process for you and you went random or maybe you even went through a, a different method to find somebody to live with freshman year. Yep, I definitely took a different method, which was going random. Um, I think a lot of students also go random. I would say the two most popular ways are either through some sort of social media or going random. Um, but I was actually very pleasantly surprised with BC's 
um, ramp them approach to finding a roommate. BC actually has a survey that's pretty um, lengthy that you'll fill out, which has everything from what time do you go to bed and wake up to do you study while listening to music or do you want to have friends come over? But I think all of those questions are really important to making sure you coexist well with your roommate. And oftentimes I've heard stories where random roommates become best friends. For me, I didn't get that lucky, but I actually coexisted super well with my roommate. Everything, you know, we woke up at the same time. Our room was nice and clean. Everything you could really ask for in a freshman roommate I had. And I think it really speaks to how well that survey kind of system that BC has works. And I couldn't have been happier with how my um, freshman living situation worked out. So you move into school and, you know, moving days kind of chaotic. You know, your parents are involved and you have a sibling there maybe and everyone else is moving in and it's usually warm. So it's kind of like a chaos. And then they leave. Parents check out. Whoever helped you move in is gone. And there you are that first night at Boston College. How did it feel? What did it feel like? And like, where did you go immediately from there? What kind of things did you start doing right from the first night of school? I think um, the first thing I felt was just kind of an immediate sense of like, I'm so independent, I'm so adult, followed by kind of uncertainty. Um, I didn't really know what to do. Thankfully, I was able to move in early through a um, extracurricular program called the Emerging Leader Program. Maddie was also in it. Um, so we did have a retreat that first week of school. However, most people move in the Thursday before the first day of Monday classes. And I will say, um, I honestly just went straight into the lounge. I had nothing else to do. You don't have any classes. You don't have any work. So right there, it's definitely a lot of kind of meet and greet. There's a bunch of different activities um, run by the school, the Office of First Year Experience um, during that welcome weekend. Um, so I sat in the lounge and honestly, a big group of people ended up just kind of shuffling in and out and we just got to know each other. Um, but beyond that, some people went into Boston in this excursion called Discovering Boston with some upperclassmen. Um, there's a service opportunity that weekend as well. There's a movie night. So definitely a lot of opportunities to kind of just explore campus, meet people and start those connections right away. And I suspect that, uh, pretty, I suspect that early on, maybe even the first night, maybe the second night, you meet the resident assistant on your hall. And I think a lot of people are pretty familiar with the, the, the RA, initials and what it means but can one of you talk about what it meant to you like was that can relationship connection something that was very meaningful I think sometimes people misconstrue RA as someone who just makes sure that you know the, all the rules are followed but there's usually something more than that people don't become resident assistants just so they can catch people and and um, you know vi in violation of the rules uh, as you met the upperclassman that was on your hall, um, did it mean anything to you? Was it helpful to you as the year went on? Yeah, I absolutely loved my RA freshman year. I saw her as soon as I came to campus. She's one of the first people I saw on campus this year because I absolutely loved her. She was actually right across from me. And when I got the layout of the dorm, I was like, oh my God, the RA is right across me. Like this could not have been worse for me. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I was like, oh geez, here we go. But literally the first day she came into the room, I gave her a big hug. Like we became such like close friends in general. I would text her all the time if I ever needed anything. And we also have these really cool activities called hoots, which are hangouts on Tuesdays or hangouts on Wednesdays late. I know some dorms had that and that's called a howl, but they were super fun activities put on by our RAs where we all would go and sit in the hallway. We'd have donuts, we'd paint. We had different activities going on every other Tuesday. So that really helped us meet people in our hall. And like Jen said, the first week or the first couple weeks, the doors are like always open. So you're always willing to just like pop into anyone's door and talk to everyone the first couple of days they're only freshmen on campus so whoever you turn to is also looking to meet new friends which is just a great time to just be with the people that are in your graduating class but aside from that my RA she was great I knew if I could always go to her for anything and it was more of like her being my sister or my mom not so much as like an authoritative figure that really stuck with me going forward into this year and having future RAs. So, so you're starting to meet people in your dorm, you're there a couple days, but obviously there are a lot more people than live in your residence hall. There's all kinds of people on campus and a lot of people that share your affinity to do service or your affinity to dance or your affinity to paint or whatever that is. So can you talk a little bit about like how, what happens next? 
you, you, you want to branch out, you want to be in different circles, you certainly want to follow the passions and interests that you might have had in high school or outside of the classroom, certainly. So like, what's next? Now that you're a week into school, what kind of things are you learning about in terms of activities and clubs? And how do you start to get involved and again, spread out a little bit more socially? Yeah, I sure hope I'm not skipping one step ahead here, but I personally found my friends through clubs and activities more so than my living situation. I mentioned that my roommate and I weren't the best of friends. He really clicked with the guys on our floor and I liked them. They were nice, but they weren't really my cup of tea. So I found most of my friends once classes started. And then the biggest help to me was the club and activities fair where all you know 300 plus student involvement organizations have tables and various kind of setups on one of our lawns and you're being thrown Frisbees and candy and shirts and everything to get your attention. You're being asked if you can sing and dance and everyone just wants you to kind of get involved with what they're doing. And through that, I was able to find some of the things that I wanted to spend my time doing. So whether it was, you know, this student admission program or the CLC, which is the Christian Life Community or the Cooking Club, the Board Game Society, there's so many things to get involved with. And I think those are the times where you can really find some like-minded people or decide to branch out and meet some more friends. Uh, was that similar for, for any others of you in terms of you know, getting out there, finding your, finding your people, you know, uh, stretching out, meeting upper, upperclassmen, uh, a similar path as Brian? Yeah, I definitely say that um, through those clubs and organizations, um, what happens is you'll get mentorship through upperclassmen or you'll get paired into families um, or just kind of like the big little system. So Yes, you'll meet a bunch of other freshmen that are getting involved in all these new opportunities as well. But all the upperclassmen are there for you because they were in your shoes not too long ago either. So they they can give you advice. They can become really close friends. Um, they can give you tips and tricks about like campus, about Boston, et cetera, things like that. And I know I made some of my closest friends um, still to this day through organizations that I became involved in freshman year last year. Good stuff. All right. So. We're, we're in the first couple of weeks, we're, we're, we're making friends, we're getting out there, we're finding people that share similar interests, we're feeling comfortable in our building, we're learning about the resources just in our building, an upperclassman that is dedicated to making sure this community that I've just joined works together and make sure that my particular needs are met. Perfect. That's textbook again, how it's supposed to go. Now let's talk about school. Uh, I can only vouch for one of you. I read Maddie McGrath's application. So I can vouch for her that I know that she's wicked, wicked smart, as we would say in Boston. Uh, I'm going to take for granted that my colleagues that covered your files said the same thing. So I know you all had tremendous credentials, but translating credentials into the expectations of college can be different. Uh, the uh, professors may stretch you in different ways. Getting grades may be different. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about the academic transition. And can maybe somebody start off by saying, was there a major difference in the kind of work that you were doing in high school to the kind of work that you were expected to do in college? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, I would say that the fundamental difference that I noticed between high school and college work is that there really isn't much busy work, at least in the classes that I took my first year. Um, whereas in high school, I feel like there's just these constant homework assignments, a lot of like little things that don't seem to matter as much, but then having no busy work in college sort of makes things feel like, wow, everything matters. Everything is much more necessary and important and I need to do perfectly at absolutely everything, um, which brings a little bit of added stress. But I would say, um, my first year academically, um, I think that BC offers so many different opportunities and resources, especially for first year students to engage with the academic scene. Um, one thing that I really loved doing was taking an enduring questions course. Um, these courses are only offered for first year students. They combine two elements of the core curriculum, which we'll probably get to talking a little bit later. Um, but it's a way to have a double credit class. Um, which is only composed of freshmen. So there were 20 first year students in my class, we met every day and building those communities for first year students in the academic scene really allows for um, us to ease into the academic transition to have professors that we see every day or more often than usual or more closely than usual um, to really offer a smooth transition. Great point, good examples. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, getting into the rhythm of things in terms of what professors are, are talking about and asking. 
back in high school, probably because you succeeded so well, you never had any time. I'd never had any problem getting time with the teacher. They knew your work ethic. They knew your interest. So getting to meet teachers in between classes or after school was probably pretty easy. And maybe you looked at professors very differently um, because the PhD behind their name or because of the setting. But have you been able to connect with professors? You know, again, a lot of people are intimidated, but you know, given the fact that now, you know, as you go through your first year, were you able to establish some good connections with, with some professors here? I would say in my experience, I definitely was. Um, I feel fortunate to be at a place where I can make those connections with professors, but I took a class called Perspectives, which again is for only first year students. And it's also a double class that combines philosophy and theology. And through that class, I was able to you know, create a pretty strong relationship with a professor named Kathleen Hull. Um, oftentimes you'll hear us refer to professors as cell phone and coffee professors, meaning they'll give you their cell phone number or they'll go you know, out and grab a cup of coffee rather than just having strict you know, business like office hours. And I think it really goes to show how much the professors want to reach out to students, not only to help them in the classroom, but also with their personal struggles. I know most students probably have one or two professors they feel like they could go to if something happened in their life, completely not relating to academics and just talk to them. But I think it's a, it's a great part of the community of BC where professors are very much involved in the lives of students and want to help them any way they can. Um, I know a good example I can give of that is when the pandemic hit and we were being sent off campus, there was a massive spreadsheet that was made of professors who live in the area and were willing to take in, you know, students' clothes or things that they couldn't bring back home with them immediately and needed some place to store. So many professors reached out to students and it was so incredible to see the outpouring of kind of help and, and you know, gratitude of the students towards those professors, but just professors wanting to help in any way possible. Um, is, is the work hard? Like, does it, is it competitive? Is it, is it tough? I mean, are you pulling an all nighter a week to get stuff done? Or do you feel the pressure from your classmates? Um, or have you found the opposite? It's much more collaborative. Like you can team up with, cl with classmates and beat calculus instead of worrying about beating someone else in calculus. I will say it is challenging. Um, there, It's definitely more academically rigorous, I'd say, than my personal experience in high school. And I feel like most people can agree with that. However, it's challenging in a way, not that you just like, there's a block and you can't get past it or anything, but professors want you to succeed and they want you to collaborate with other students. And that creates that campus culture of collaboration, I'd say to the second part of your question, Chris. Um, students aren't trying to get ahead at the expense of other students. They're trying to kind of work together and find a solution to a problem together, conceptualize a theory together, or just talk about um, different problems or situations that you face in class together. And I think that's what really sets BC students apart and kind of that BC academic culture apart from other schools. Now, what happens a lot I find is that because you guys got into Boston College and you have these credentials, when you hit a snag academically, when you get into a rut, like you're kind of stubborn about it because you know that you've been successful and you just figure you're going to work it out. However, sometimes it's harder to come by and we hope that students utilize the academic support that's available for students of all years. In fact, I know that it's over half of our students that take advantage of our academic services and support every year. Are you guys familiar with what these things are? Have you participated in, do you know about them? What's their reputation on campus? Certainly I can't imagine it's seen as something that has a negative uh, reputation. Um, what, what do you know of the academic support available on campus? Um, I can speak on the Connors Family Learning Center, which is a really great resource for students on campus. Um, the Connors Family Learning Center is located on the second floor of O'Neill Library, and it's like our own little windowed room with like a view of the stairs. It's kind of cool. Um, but the Connors Family Learning Center is a really great resource um, for students um, to a variety of all academic subjects. So um, I've never used the writing feature, but I know that um, there's a resource where students can submit papers to be edited um, and they can be reviewed by either a graduate student tutor or a peer undergraduate reviewer within 24 hours. Um, I personally have taken advantage of the Connors Family Learning Center through my statistics professor. Um, I took econ statistics my second semester freshman year and it was very difficult for me. And my professor um, had a direct connection in 
the CFLC um, to have access to like all of his econ stats materials. Um, and so when I walked in, they were very familiar with the material and very open to walk me through it. Um, and just very open in general to support one another and to support um, everyone who walks in that door. There's also a lot of other issues when terms of transitioning. It's all the people that you left at home. Uh, your parents, your siblings, your friends that are off at other places. You went through a freshman year. Certainly the last part of it was very challenging, not just because you were first year students, but because you were human beings. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about your connection to home through the first year? Um, and let's, let, let's leave the, the pandemic related part to the side, just because that was a universal. We were all, <laughs> we're all worried about our, our people. But can you talk about like the, the, especially the first semester as you're navigating through this new place, how much you stay in touch, touch with everybody at home? Um, what were your ups and downs? What was it like maintaining that life and your new life at BC? Yeah, so the first night at school, my mom and my sister and my dad had written me like letters. So I was like bawling my eyes out the first night just because it was like the first step. It's like starting my college experience. I know, but it wasn't sad. It was just like, oh, like, this is, it was just like a stepping stone um, into my college experience, but I didn't really feel homesick, which is actually really great because I actually had to go home for my sister's confirmation in October. So we have, we're, we have super easy transportation coming from here to New Jersey, there and back. We have a um, airport very close. I took the bus home one time, I took the train home one time. So definitely very accessible. If you ever feel like you need to go home or if there's a necessity for you to go home for. So I went to my sister's confirmation. I left on a Friday, came back on a Sunday. But by the time it was almost Thanksgiving, I was feeling a little homesick. So I definitely missed my family and friends, but I had the opportunity to visit my friends during spring break because I think our spring break usually fall. We have a longer Easter break. So that was a time that I had planned to see friends. And also like our spring break, I had gone and seen my friends and some of them have con come to visit as well since New Jersey isn't too far, only a drive away. And I have friends like UConn and URI. So definitely accessible since we're in a college town as well. If you have friends that go to any other school in Boston, it's really accessible. But I think I kept up my FaceTimes like religiously. I would always religiously FaceTime my friends each week and my mom just to keep everyone, um, keep everyone in the loop about what's going on here at BC. But very nice that I live like not too far away, but I'm sure Jen can also talk about being far from home, but still talking with her friends and family. Yeah, does someone else want to chime in? Uh, maybe someone that did have a little bit more distance in between. Yes, of course. So um, obviously going back to Florida wasn't just as accessible. However, I will say that definitely made me realize um, who like my closest friends were in high school because there's kind of that mutual experience of being busy. My friends were also going to a new college setting, even if that was in Florida, they were also busy with extracurriculars, their own work, et cetera. But I think it was that mutual experience that we wanted to like kind of share with each other and keep up. And I think with also having a roommate and living in a communal style, um, like housing format freshman year, it became really cool. And some of my friends would like meet my home friends over like FaceTime and it was like worlds colliding. So then when the, my two best friends did visit, um, thankfully in the spring earlier before we went home, that was so cool to have like everyone come together and it was kind of a solid mixture. And I think just having that um, connection home was really important to kind of take a step back, have a break, have people understand like your background and your past as well. Um, and so like they know what challenges um, you may face when like making decisions or things like that. So that was definitely nice to use FaceTime and definitely have that resource, but also just uh, have a strong support system while being here as well. So we do like to think that there's a, a, a number of resources for students that are kind of struggling with the transition as they're learning more about themselves. Uh, without the support system of home. And you know, we like to think that there are counseling services and other services on campus. Are you guys familiar with that? Did you learn about that through orientation? And are, are there points about that uh, resource at BC that you know pretty well? Um, I can speak to that a little bit. I think that, um, not only does like BC as a whole, but the students of BC emphasize um, that there are so many people and so many resources out there on campus to help you if you're struggling. 
Um, a couple that I've been aware of, um, and also resident assistants RAs are very helpful in connecting students um, with resources if ever needed. Um, so University Counseling Services is located in the basement of Gasson at the very center of campus, which is very accessible to students um, if they ever need support. And another resource that my RA was very, very um, adamant on plugging last year was this resource called Lean On Me. Um, which is an anonymous hotline um, offered at BC, but there are also other chapters um, at colleges across the country. That's just an anonymous texting hotline um, if you ever need somebody to lean on. Um, and overall, I just think that the BC community is very supportive. Um, everyone, including professors, friends, upperclassmen, just want to know how you're doing and want to check in. Um, and so I think that just in general, it's a very uplifting community. Um, all of you were new to a Jesuit Catholic school. Uh, incidentally, I, I went to Boston College High School. So like, I, I would have known what I was getting myself into, but all of you didn't. So this was your first time being in a Jesuit school, maybe a Catholic school as well. So I want to get maybe a couple of you can volunteer sort of how that presented itself to you during your first year. Uh, was it something you pursued? Was it something that pursued you? Was it a surprise in terms of how it manifested itself? Um, and was there anything particularly Jesuit about your freshman year? So I know that's a lot, maybe pick one or two of those questions and maybe a couple of you can answer that. Yeah, like you said, I personally didn't have any experience with Jesuit or Jesuit Catholic education. I went to public school from kindergarten through senior year. So coming to BC, I didn't really know at all what to expect. I am a practicing Catholic, I will say. So, you know, having the opportunity to go to mass on Sundays and have those resources available was certainly nice entering. But what I was more surprised and probably enjoyed more were the other resources that I never really knew came with going to a religiously affiliated school. Um, I would say the biggest one for me was the retreat culture. I actually went on four retreats in my senior year, which is certainly abnormal, but something I'm really glad I did. I met some great people. And even on those retreats, they were very, you know, in very different subjects. So one of them was all about studying. Another was about making friends with other first year students. Another was about bringing a club closer together. And the last one was a spiritual retreat um, to learn more about your faith and meet other people through the Catholic or Christian faith. Um, but I think that just kind of speaks to, to the resources that are available to BC through things like campus ministry and through um, exploring spirituality or reflection. Uh, I will also mention, I think some of our mottos like being men and women for others or cure personalis, which means the education of the whole person come from being a Jesuit Catholic school and they open you up to whether that's, you know, service and volunteering or those retreats that I mentioned or various clubs and activities. There's certainly a lot more um, involvements that you can have through um, places like campus ministry and I never really knew that was the case coming here and I'm super glad that I was able to engage in some of those things once I learned about them here at BC. Uh, great answer Brian. Um, how about someone else sort of again uh, some people had that concern coming in some people came here for that express reason that there's a Jesuit Catholic mission so hearing from someone else about how it presented itself how you felt it how you learned about it in your freshman year would be really interesting. I can go ahead. Um, I think just coming in, I was definitely apprehensive about what Jesuit Catholic identity meant and how that would kind of embody itself in my freshman year, especially. I think what has, I've been able to reflect on what has impacted me the most, and that really is um, the idea of discernment. And I think that's tied very closely to Jesuit values. Um, I think in high school, going to a very large public high school, I feel like it was always very busy. There was never really time to kind of sit and reflect and think on like the greater questions on, okay, what am I actually happy doing? What, what am I good at doing? And like, why am I doing this? And I think those questions were asked a lot, not only in classes, but also between peers and classmates, um, which I think was super amazing being able to kind of discern what I am interested in, what I am good at, and also how I can help others, um, which is also just a really big Jesuit ideal. Well played. And again, it, it, it's, I always describe it as like a campfire. Like there, you're right, that Father Casey description of there are some people that are really close and putting s'mores in the campfire that are getting a lot out of it and a lot of direct connection. And then there are people on the periphery of the campfire that are just having conversations with people and are just like slightly warmed by it. And 
I think everybody kind of gets it. It's just a matter of how close you are to the fire. Um, and that's going to evolve, I think, as you get older at Boston College. And um, that's the beauty of it, too, uh, that there's no uh, one size fits all in terms of the mission, which is important, too. Uh, so uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes going through some of the questions that people asked, and we're just going to rapid fire some answers. Uh, this is going to be the fun part of our night. Um, so I'm going to ask, I'll, I'll pick on um, uh, Maddie. So Maddie, someone asked about like your typical weekend at BC. So take me through a typical weekend. What kind of things do you normally do? Uh, try to keep it, you know, we're, this is a family show. So try to keep it very G rated. If, you know, I don't know how crazy it gets uh, with Maddie McGrath and her weekend plans, but uh, what kind of things, where do you go? What do you do? Yeah, so being um, at Boston College in Chestnut Hill, like 15 or 20 minutes away from downtown Boston is such a cool thing. Um, and there are so many different things to do both on and off campus during the weekends. Um, in regard to on-campus activities, the Campus Activities Board makes a very, very sincere effort in planning activities, um, whether it be apple picking excursions or trivia nights on campus, um, a variety of really fun things for any student to participate in on campus. I personally have loved going to acapella shows. Um, one of my best friends is in an improv comedy group. Um, and so going to her shows are always really fun. Sports games are a huge part of BC culture, especially our D1 football team in the fall, our D1 hockey team um, in the late fall, early winter. Um, and as well as many of our other D1 sports, um, which I've personally really loved watching. Um, and in regard to the city of Boston, um, being a BC student has a lot of perks. We get free passes to the aquarium. We get free passes to most museums um, in the greater Boston area and discounted tickets to sports games. Um, so I personally have loved like going to Newbury Street, getting a nice little lunch, going out with friends, having a little bit of a city day, but I've also loved exploring the multitude of opportunities on campus. Thank you, Maddie, well done. Uh, a couple of people had questions about diversity and inclusion on our campus, finding cultural organizations and certainly how that plays itself out to the community at large. Can any of you talk a little bit about how your impression of diversity in the year, your freshman year, how these organizations and cultural organizations identified themselves and what kind of activism there was on campus in terms of making sure that all traditions can be celebrated and all kinds of backgrounds are comfortable at our school. Yeah, I, I, I can take this one. Um, so I grew up in a predominantly white town and I went to a public school, but my mom is originally from the Dominican Republic and my dad is originally from Colombia. And growing up in a predominantly white town, it was not a part of myself that I was deeply in touch with, I would say. Um, definitely when holidays came around and I saw my family members that I would be intact with that side of me. But everyday life, definitely there weren't any clubs or organizations even at my school that I could have joined to really get in touch with this side of me. And even going into freshman year, all throughout freshman year, I was hesitant to join these clubs because I feel like um, I'm like so deeply Americanized and I like don't speak Spanish fluently. It was something I'm very like still insecure about. I'm still working towards it, but something I was insecure about joining those diversity groups and those cultural groups because I thought I wouldn't fit in, fit in with them. And I was having a hard time finding myself at BC. Like as soon as I got here, that was my interpretation. But I ended up meeting my best friend who is my roommate right now, lives in this bed. Um, I met her on a retreat, 48 hours. And it's basically a reflection on your freshman year. And she was an OLA, Organization of Latin American Affairs here on campus. And she really encouraged me to join. So I ended up joining my second semester freshman year and I'm in it right now. We actually just had an, had an event called um, Latinx in the upcoming election. So we're talking about um, different concerns to the Latinx community and things like that. But it's also like a great cultural group. We, uh, we have a dance team within our club. Um, and it's a great way to meet new people that share different traditions and commonalities with you, but also meet people that can diversify your point of view. You don't have to be Latinx to join these Latinx clubs or these Ahana groups, um, but it's definitely a part of me that I'm happy I got in touch with. And it's definitely an opportunity to, for people to experience diversity here on campus. Wonderful answer. Jen, did you want to add anything to that too? I was actually going to mention Ola as well, but just in general, um, there are just 
so many cultural organizations and it's amazing to see how many students whether they identify with that culture background or not just go out to support these organizations in all of their events whether it's um, art shows dance shows um, different like offerings of food um, it's just really cool to see how engaged students are in experiencing whether it's the culture of their roommates their friends their peers or just something that they want to learn about um, I think it's really inspiring uh, whether or not we find the Jesuit Catholic uh, heritage of Boston College inclusive, there are a lot of questions that people have uh, about not being Catholic, not being Christian, and still feeling comfortable and still feeling as engaged a member of the community as everybody else. Um, do any of you have a particular response to that or experience that can make people understand what it might be like if they were not to be Catholic, but still uh, function and thrive on our campus at our school? Um, I personally can't speak from personal experience um, as I was raised Catholic, but my roommate this year is Jewish um, and she has found absolutely no difficulty fitting in or finding her place or finding her voice at BC. Um, I think that one pillar of the Jesuit education um, includes multi-faith dialogue, um, which is a really cool part of BC's campus. And I think that um, my roommate has found a lot of really cool resources um, whether it be opportunities to meet other Jewish students at BC um, or just to engage um, with any form of religious discussion. I think that um, attending a religious school encourages all BC students to contemplate um, just the role of religion or spirituality in their lives as a whole, whether it be affiliated with an organized religion or not. Um, and so speaking on behalf of my roommate, um, I think that BC is very inclusive to all students regardless of their religious background. Uh, Brian, as the expert in all things retreat related, uh, can you rattle off some of the major retreats that are available at Boston College? And I know that you've taken part, but um, others that you haven't or others that you know about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this, the ones I went on, the first one was the biggest one called 48 Hours, which is around 600 students a year. We're all first year students go on that. I would highly recommend it. I also saw a question there was how do students find those? They'll be highly publicized to freshmen at BC. You'll see them at the student involvement fairs and you'll see you know emails about them, but they're hard to miss. Um, another one I went on was the Freshman League retreat for the club that is called Freshman League. Another was called Study by the Sea, which happened just before finals. That was the academic one I mentioned, as well as the Ignite retreat for first year students. Um, but in addition to that, there's Kairos, the very popular one, um, and some others. Obviously, they all have very different kind of meanings and significances into who goes and what you learn while you're there. But there are certainly ones, you know, that help develop you in leadership capacities or help you kind of learn more about your faith or dive further into your faith. And then some of the other ones I mentioned that are just more, you know, secular retreats that just take you off campus, maybe for uh, an hour, maybe it's just one day, maybe it's two days, maybe it's 48 hours, like 48 hours is called, um, but it teaches you to reflect, to take some time off of campus and kind of empty your brain, get away from the stress and just learn to um, reflect, like I said, which is one of BC's core tenets and how you're taught to um, kind of perceive your education. Good stuff. Uh, someone asked, and, and I wanted to get back to this, so I'm glad, I'm very happy someone asked this question. When you guys all introduced yourself, like there was like this 45 word description of the majors you had and the minors you had and all the things that you've de like determined. So can, can one of you that has like a major and a minor or two majors talk a little about like how that happened? Like was that the plan? Did you stumble into this? Was it recommended to you? Just how people make their choices about what to major in. I'm sure there are people out there that have no idea what they're going to major in and certainly have no idea what some of these majors are, like management for social good or whatever that is. Uh, so can you talk, can one of you volunteer just sort of how it worked out for you that have multiple majors or multiple minors? Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, it's definitely not something I planned at all. I came in as a political science major and thankfully I stuck with that, but I do know a lot of people that have completely dropped their major and just changed it to something very different or maybe something along the lines with something um, just kind of similar, maybe within the same school or not. So overall, what is comforting to know is that you don't officially have to declare a major until the end of your sophomore year. Yes, when you apply into BC, you are applying into one of the four main academic divisions. And with that, I will say that it is um, very smart to apply into one of those three pre-professional schools if that's something you think you might be interested in, just because those are smaller and so it's a little bit trickier um, to switch in afterwards. Um, so for me, I started off as 
a political science major. And then through one of my core classes, actually perspectives, I also took that as well my freshman year, I met someone who was in the Lynch School of Education studying applied psychology. I had never heard of that major before and I got to talking to them and it sounded like the coolest thing in the world. So I actually met with an academic advisor from the Lynch School and found out that it was possible for me to do a transfer between schools. So I'm now a Lynch student, but also a student in the Morrison College of Arts and Sciences. I feel like a lot of students maybe kind of find minors or majors in that similar way where they kind of hear about it or are exposed to it uh, through the core curriculum, which is really cool. Um, and there is definitely a lot of advising and help that goes on to see if that path is possible, if it is possible to double major or pick up a minor or things like that. And I think students are very engaged in trying to learn new things. And that is why you see a lot of double majoring or minoring. Um, someone asked a question that I'm just gonna rephrase a little bit. Um, all of you now are very wise seasoned sophomores. And if you learned from any mistakes in your freshman year, you certainly would never repeat them. Did you make any mistakes last year that if you could do it all again, you would make a different decision? Uh, and then I'm talking about maybe big picture things. I'm not talking about, you know, you know, what shower shoes you bought. I'm talking about like big things. So uh, inform people so they don't have to make the mistake that you did. Uh, what makes mistake did you make freshman year that you would never repeat and you advise these people not to not to do? Well, I'm kind of sad to admit that it didn't take too long for me to think of a, a mistake that I made, and there's probably plenty of them, but the biggest one that comes to mind that I think might be universal for a lot of people is don't be someone you're not in an attempt to try to make friends. I think it takes time, and some people, you know, need to hear that because it's not an instantaneous thing. For me, it took a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months to meet my best friends on campus, and there are going to be times where you just want to pretend you want to talk about things that you just don't want to talk about so you fit in wherever you are, so you feel like you're befriending the people you're around, and there are going to be some days where you might go to lunch alone and not have a friend to eat lunch with, and those times can feel really deflating when you're just moving to a new place and you just want to make friends with people and you just left all your closest friends but it's all right to have those moments that you don't really enjoy knowing that in you know maybe two hours later you're going to meet your very best friend for the rest of your life and there's so many people on campus that you're bound to meet the people that you're going to get along with best so make sure you stick to who you are and be the person that you want to be so that when you meet those people you are being your authentic self great great answer brian uh how about someone else uh, I mean, that was a tough one to top, but just so people don't have to live through the same mistakes or same decisions that, that you might regret, anything looking back on it that you change, uh, just so people could understand a little bit better about how they manage their freshman year? Yeah, I'd say one thing that was very hard for me freshman year, and I think I'm still kind of working on it now, is making sure to give yourself alone time. Um, you are going to be living with a roommate. Um, I am still in the traditional double, even as a sophomore. So it's not a lot of alone time that you have, but you gotta find those moments to take a walk around like the reservoir um, that we have here. Go eat lunch by yourself. That was something that I was so afraid of doing freshman year. And now I do it like just to have some free time, listen to music, watch Netflix, whatever, but you need some time to yourself. It's, I think it's really important to kind of de-stress, um, and just not focus on like being socialized all the time because it is really important to kind of have that one-on-one -on -one time with yourself. That's great stuff. Um, real quickly, before we wrap up, um, how are we doing now? So uh, the freshman year that you had wasn't a year. It was two thirds of a year. Uh, and now you've been you know, brought back to a school and you're not the youngest people there now, and you're looked at as people who know what's going on, and even though you didn't quite have a full year under your belt. Um, how are you doing? Uh, and, and when it comes to being back on campus, feeling comfortable, uh, can one or two of you just real quick just talk about how life is for you guys right now on campus? Um, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I think that as we talk about the freshman experience, as we wrap up this entire discussion of how your freshman year looks, I think that there's a way of making it seem as though like once you make it through this hurdle of your freshman year that you just have everything figured out and you figured out Boston College and that you just like did all these first few things and then you're golden. Um, I definitely think that um, 
being a sophomore, having completed my freshman year kind of has made me realize that I still have a lot of more, a lot more room to grow. Um, and I certainly am not 100% solid on my majors um, or maybe picking up a minor yet. Um, and I think that entering sophomore year, I think um, is a little bit more of an affirmation of the fact that your college experience is four years, unless you choose to graduate in three, which isn't very common at BC. But um, understanding that there's still so much more time to learn and grow. Um, so I would say um, I'm, I'm doing well, but um, certainly still <laughs> figuring out, you know, what I'm going to make of the rest of my BC experience beyond freshman year and easing in um, because nothing feels new anymore. Nothing feels, you know, like, oh my gosh, I need to like find my way to Fulton Hall. Um, and so I think having that knowledge of like, this is okay. Like, here's my school. Here's what I'm going to do with it and going in deeper. Um, and that's something that I've been excited for for sophomore year. Yeah. In terms of Corona time, like I like to call it, um, I feel like we all came into school not knowing if we're going to have too much free time, not enough free time. And I feel like it has been super busy being back on campus. I'm squeezing extra things in. I wouldn't have time to like maybe walk to. Um, after learning about the resources at BC freshman year, I think I'm definitely taking advantage of them now. For example, I went to virtual office hours um, at the Career Center to look over my resume. I'm meeting with my new advisor. So we get advisors assigned to us based on our majors sophomore year. So freshman year, it's just someone, maybe you're taking a class with them and they get assigned to you, but sophomore year, it becomes more based on your major. So I had the opportunity to meet with my advisor, who I absolutely love, Dr. Spangler. She's great in the sociology department. She's been helping me out so much. Um, I really appreciate her and the Career Center. So no, like, freshman year you learn about all these resources that BC has you might venture into the career center or different parts of campus but sophomore year, sophomore year you're really taking advantage of the things that you learned about freshman year so I feel like that's the spot I'm in now trying to schedule all these zoom calls but there's definitely stuff that won't go away because we're reaching so many more people like there are 331 people on this call right now that might not have been able to come to campus for any reason so there's definitely things that have come out of this time that are really positive, And I feel like we're making the best of it here at BC. Well, let that be the final word. Um, but all of you were so eloquent and articulate about, you know, going through a real tough time. You know, we'd love to say how awesome it is to go to college, but it's not, every day isn't perfect. And there are struggles and you rely on people and you make great friends. And uh, I thought you guys really just from the heart, just talked a little bit about yeah, it's great. And there are resources there and you need to be humble enough to, to know when you need them and revel in what your friends uh, can give you and try to be good to everyone at home that supports you. Um, you guys did such a great job. I'm stalling for a second so all of you viewers at home can write down the email addresses and names of all the panelists we have, just so you can um, keep the conversation going. Um, we have the kind of student organization in the, um, in the admissions office that this is what we do. And because this is gonna be a very unorthodox way to find your college, let's use technology. Uh, you can find my stuff on the website. I'm not technology, technologically savvy enough to fiddle with my name in that box. I don't know how to do that, but you can find my stuff on the website. And certainly you can reach out to these guys, uh, who I'm really proud of in the way they talked about freshman year. Um, if, you're, if you're still interested, of course, there's a few more of these uh, virtual open house sessions coming up. Uh, and then we have an information session every day uh, as well as a live streaming tour. And you might even see some of these faces, which are some of the, the rising stars in the student admissions program. That's what sophomores are. So thanks guys, I really appreciate it. And for all the viewers, thanks for giving us a little bit of time. We went about an hour, which I didn't know if we were gonna get there, but I guess we could have done a lot more. So I appreciate your time. Good luck to all of you. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks guys. <laughs>